So excited to be bringing on our first guest. Uh, Susan Abuhawa is a Palestinian-American writer and human rights activist. She's the author of Mornings in Janine, which was translated into 32 languages and sold more than a million copies. The Blue Between Sky and Water and Against the Loveless World, and I've read all of them and they're all wonderful. She's the founder of Playgrounds for Palestine and the executive director of Palestine Rights. And she is joining us uh, to talk about a recent trip that she made to Gaza. So welcome, Susan. Hi, Katie. Hi, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. So tell us what you did in Gaza. What made you want to go? Uh, how long you were there? What you saw? Just start, I guess, from the beginning in, in terms of what you were doing there. I can't really talk about, um, you know, how or, or how I got in, et cetera. But I went to do whatever I could. It's weird to explain the desire to to be there. It's kind of... I don't understand the desire not to be there, to be honest. It, you know, somebody in actually in Gaza actually asked me, aren't you scared being here? Like, we, we have to, we don't have a choice. And I, and I thought about it, and, and quite honestly, it felt harder to, to watch them from afar than to just be there with them. To watch this, to watch an extermination unfold, live streamed to the world, and be paralyzed um, and not be able to do anything was intolerable. And I, I suppose that was, that was the, the impulse to go in the first place. Um, and once I was there, it was in part to bear witness, um, also to bring in whatever supplies I could bring in to drop in the ocean um, of, of the need that's, that exists there. To um, and also to to sort of get some programs going uh, through playgrounds for Palestine for children in particular psychological first aid. We also or I also held um, a writing workshop for young Palestinian writers to um, to help them begin to narrate their lives in this moment because I think they should be the authors of this historic moment, not anybody else. And that's something that I'm I'm keen to really follow through with to to try and ensure their voices come out of this um, in narrative form. And how was that? How was it um, teaching these young people? First of all, they're immensely talented. Um, I was, you know, I didn't know, uh, I, I didn't know who they were or what their level of writing was. And it was a, a beautiful surprise how, uh, what excellent writers they were and the stories they, they had to tell. My role was really trying to help them hone in on the details. Um, that, you know, the impulse is always to sort of give the, the overarching sort of narrative um, and just, I was just trying to impart what I've learned as a writer, uh, over the years of the craft and they're all writing in Arabic. Um, and so the, 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 the workshops were conducted in Arabic, which means that, uh, um, I've recruited, you know, I mean, I can read and write Arabic and I can provide input on, on the, structure of their stories and stuff but ultimately the language needs a different editor and so we've uh, recruited um, other writers from the Arab world who are going to help with this and hopefully inshallah it will will have an anthology come out of this oh great you know these are just these are small things um katie that you know one person uh could do in gaza of course it's not you know it's not changing the situation uh, and and ultimately it means nothing except in the lives of those few people that are directly touched by this small effort. It makes an impact. Well, it's what I could do. It's that's what I could offer. And that's what I, um, you know, I'm willing to do whatever, whatever I have to do. I mean, I know speaking for myself, it's, it's just a fear of, of death 
that makes me not go. Sometimes I just say, you know, I really should be over there. And then. Yeah. And I understand that. And I, and actually there's a part of me that was thinking, you know, before I left, I, I made a will and, and all that. And, um, but then I'm like, you know, I'm not better than anybody else. And, uh, my friends who, who've been killed there, um, didn't deserve to be killed. And, and at the end of the day, you know, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go in Gaza. Tell us more about what you saw in Gaza. I wrote about most of the, the individual cases. There's, there's actually tons more, um, people that I spoke with. And actually after I, after I returned, there's, um, there's a psychologist that I was working closely there and, he told me about a uh, uh, a woman that he's working with. Um, he you know, he got her permission to tell me. Um, I don't know her name. Uh, she she was abducted by the Israelis. She was held in detention and uh, for uh, I think it was three weeks, and she was raped uh, by by nine uh, soldiers. Her children were. Uh, killed uh, and her husband she knows nothing about where he is he was injured um, and she doesn't know if he's alive or dead and um, you know th- what he described to me is harrowing there's also um, b- besides the the you know the outright rape stories there's also a lot of other sexual crimes of like for example when they invade homes or invade schools or whatever, of course they strip the men usually. Um, but there, there were several cases where they stripped both the men and the women and they made them all stand in the same room and they were blindfolded and they would take their blindfolds off. And of course, everybody's, you know, immediate uh, reaction is to close their eyes to spare everybody else's dignity. And, and they, um, but they told them that, you know, they made them look and they said, open your eyes. And said, if you don't open your eyes and look, we're going to shoot you. And they were shooting people who, who didn't just look. Um, so that, so that was happening. I mean, it's just crimes on such a sadistic, systematic, unreal scale. You know, I think we all understood for a long time how what a pathological society Israel uh, was. But to see to see how truly pervasive it is within the whole society has in some ways been surprising. I mean, to not be, for this, for the entire society to not be at all moved in any way by this ineffable agony that they're inflicting on people is something that I think scientists are going to be studying for decades because, because this is a truly sociopathic society. It, it should not be welcome among the rest of humanity. It really should not. This kind of um, sociopathy is really shocking. And, and I think maybe the world is finally seeing what Palestinians have had to live under for so long. Um, it's, it's this like psychopathy that has been, you know, branded as morality and the most moral army and the, the only democracy and all these other asinine slogans that bear no resemblance to reality. It really is unbelievable to see people defending Israel now, given all we've seen on social media, I think it was easier to be in denial about Israel before. And now it just requires real either dishonesty and, you know, a genuine disregard for Palestinians, like they just don't care, or brainwashing, or some kind of, as you said, um, psychopathy. And the fact that 
even among Israelis who are critical of Netanyahu, it's not, some of them are critical of him from the right, that he's not killing more Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of support for the amount of force, except that they want more force. Yeah, they want to, I mean, even even here in the U.S., there's some, you know, that Wahlberg, Congressman Wahlberg. It's Joe Biden's reason. We need to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. I don't think we should. I, I don't think any of our aid that goes to Israel to support our greatest ally, arguably maybe in the world, to defeat Hamas <laughs> and Iran and Russia, and probably North Korea is in there in China too, with them and helping, helping uh, uh, Hamas. We shouldn't be spending a dime on humanitarian aid. It, it should be like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Get it over. Of course, he he tried to walk it back a little because of the backlash. But you know, we all heard him. This this, this they're also like gaslighting the whole world. Like we hear and see what the hell they're doing. And then they come on and just like with a straight face and say, um, no, we didn't. That's not how it was. Hamas did it. Um, you know, it was it was an error, uh, you know, targeting and and firing three separate missiles into the WCK clearly marked cars. Oh, it's just the fog of war.